Uh, it's such a pleasure to welcome to this series Tan Lin. Uh, at Rain Taxi, we've had a very long fondness for this author's work. We reviewed his first book, Lotion Bullwhip Giraffe, in our first year of publication. Um, and uh, uh, that book masterfully contorted language into waves and waves of playful lyrical delight, reinventing experimental poetry for the new millennium, and beginning this author's ongoing fascination with linguistic innovation, or with rendering li linguistic innovation, uh, as he puts it, more relaxing. <laughs> as he explained in an interview he and I did just a few days ago, a poem is not much different from a faucet dripping in the room next door, or a particular shade of paint that was a slightly different shade 10 minutes or 10 years ago. I love that. Poet Charles Bernstein brilliantly summed up the importance of this particular aspect of Lynn's work when he wrote, these are not meditative poems, but temporal processes cast into words, permeable, open, meandering. Since Lotion Bullwhip Giraffe, Tan Lin has published many works under the ostensible sign of poetry or fiction, though most of his writing evades such easy categorization. Take his recent book, Insomnia and the Ant, an ambient novel composed of photographs, postcards, Google searches, letters, footnotes, and more. The ant of the title indeed can't get any sleep, or maybe she's just a figment from late night TV. Or take his book, Heath Course Pack, which draws on news feeds about actor Heath Ledger's death to create a history of performance art, a defense of plagiarism, an examination of text messages as distribution networks for human sadness, along with photos, annotations, and coffee stains. It's worth noting that in addition to his genre-bending books, Tan Lin's video and performative works have been shown at museums and galleries internationally, and that he's the recipient of a Getty Distinguished Artist Grant and a Creative Capital Arts Writing Grant to, for a book-length study on the writings of Andy Warhol. But perhaps my favorite accolade for Tan Lin comes from a remark made by one of his undergraduate creative writing students at New Jersey City University. It's kind of a total mindfuck, reports the student. <laughs> he changes the way you think about poetry and about what poetry is. That's as high a compliment as any poet can receive. Please welcome Tan Lin. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have Eric's notes here. I was tempted to read them again. Um, I'm going to be screening a, a bunch of movies today, um, and I'll read a little bit, too. I want to thank um, Eric at Rain Taxi. Um, and I remember when my first book, Lotion, came out, and I got a review. I was, like, ecstatic. I, you know, usually a poetry book sort of comes, and no one pays attention, especially a first book. So, uh, yeah, I was extremely happy. And I have some history with Minnesota, because I, I went to college in, in Carlt at Carleton in Northfield. Um, but I have not been back to Minnesota for, well, I, I won't say exactly when, how long, but it's been a while. But I do remember the, uh, my freshman year at Carleton, um, one thing that we did was um, we went winter camping in the Boundary Waters. Um, and I still remember that trip. It was uh, uh, extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to read... Um, well, I'm going to show movies, and we thought, just to make this a little more conversational, it would be nice, um, I don't know if you're a talkative group tonight or not, but we thought it would be nice to have conversation while this was going on. So, since we're going to be showing videos, and they're pretty modular, discrete, episodic, um, sort of spatially oriented, I thought it would be nice to just have a discussion right after the video, if you wanted. Um, and if you're quiet, that's okay, we'll just move on to the next video. Um, Feel free to walk around. There will be some music. Um, if you want to dance, that's okay. Um, you can keep your cell phones on. And that's a good idea in this case. Um, I wasn't kidding when I said that when you came in. Um, 
I'm going to read, I'm going to start with just a few things. I've been, I'm interested in sort of what literature would look like on different platforms. Um, and I've been writing a lot of restaurant reviews for Yelp under, you know, various numbers of names. <laughs> so. <clears throat> and I, the, this book I'm going to read from, it's called Seven Controlled Vocabularies and Obituary 2004, The Joy of Cooking. And people ask me, you know, why did you give it so many names? And why did you call it the joy of cooking? And I think there are two reasons for this. One was um, my parents came from China in the like, late 40s and early 50s. And that was the book that they learned how to cook American food with. And in that way, that's kind of how I felt like I became American. But I also thought that by putting the joy of cooking in the title, I would increase my Google hits. <laughs> and I think I have. All right, this is called RPT MC60 0.278. What is the relation between a fruit and a vegetable? A book transpires one letter and then one word at a time, and nothing about reading can prevent this from happening. For this reason, books are best diluted or read over a good many years. Only things that are consumed endure beyond their shelf life. Nothing is really very different if you say it is. I had dinner yesterday at WD50, which is a restaurant located where the new Fukienese area of Chinatown and the old pickle shops of the defunct Lower East Side almost come into alignment. The restaurant is at 50 Clinton Street and it has a post craftsman style decor with bulbous glass lamps that look like fluorescent flower bulbs. The chef's name is Wiley Dufresne. He is young and looks like a cowboy reincarnated as a skateboarder. His father, Dewey, is also a chef. WD-50 is probably the only restaurant in Manhattan that makes you hallucinate the food you are eating while you are eating it. The food can be quite unfood-like. I ate at the restaurant a few nights ago, and afterwards my taste buds felt incongruous and ecstatic. I remember seeing something on another table that looked like dessert, and I ordered it. A few moments later, there were bonbon-sized bits of pineapple on a plate. They had been soaked in something briny and had become pickles. Off to one side of the fruit was smeared what looked like hot fudge sauce, except that it was made of ketchup and jalapeno peppers. The sauce was semi-frozen. The sauce was hot and cold and cold and hot, I couldn't tell which. I put the pineapple in my mouth and it was like eating something that was once a vegetable. The chef had sprinkled some salt, scented with what looked like dour chips of limes. It was not really necessary to eat the food, one could breathe it. When I put all this in my mouth, I tasted so many things I forgot what was in my mouth. Eating at WD-50 is like reading Proust backwards. I looked over at a man at the table next to ours, and he had the face of a six-year-old. The ideas of food erase the food itself and then become the food you did not think you were eating. Time passes inordinately, or not at all. What is it like to eat an idea or its suggestion? As anyone who has eaten can tell you, the most beautiful memories are memories that one has forgotten how to have. Eating at WD-50 is like having psychoanalysis with a starch, a sugar, or a fat. Okay. All right, I'm gonna show a video now, um, and it's called 11 Minute Painting. It runs 11 minutes, so I'm gonna let it run for sort of more or less the whole time. But I was really interested in what kind of reading um, would this work provide. It was initially done for um, um, the Yale Art Museum. And so one of the problems with showing um, any textual work in a museum is actually to get people to read it. Um, so, and I'm interested mainly in sort of a longer durational reading things too. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not so interested in short graphic things, um, you know, that you would get, say, with um, Jenny Holzer or Barbara Kruger. I really w wanted something long, boring, meditative, and absorptive. And again, the question is, well, how can you get people in sort of an art setting to look at something like that? So we're gonna show this, it's called 11 Minute Painting. And, and I think maybe we could talk a little bit about it afterwards, because it'll be a little clearer what's sort of going on or not going on, okay? Eleven Minute Painting, Reading Module V.1, by Dan Malin, Dub Version, Aside. What are the forms of non-reading and what are the non-forms the reading might take? Poetry equals wallpaper. 
Novel equals design object. Text as ambient soundtrack. Duchamp wanted to create works of art that were non-retinal. It would be nice to create works of literature that didn't have to be read but could be looked at, like placemats. The most exasperating thing at a poetry reading is always the sound of a poet reading. The poem you are about to see, the version, is executed in director and plays independently of any intuited reading, voice, practices. It takes place in real time. Unlike a feedback loop it is different each time it is played. The poem you are reading is in BW because BW is more soothing than color. Halfway through, a color randomizer has been utilized to provide a greater sense of visual permutation, change and pleasure. One word, then another, and finally a third follow each other in a kind of slow motion, time-lapse photography. Beside, poems to be looked at versus poems to be read versus paintings to be sequenced versus paintings to be sampled. Everything that is beautiful is a code for something that is already known. Nothing should be unknown. The program code you are watching generates 16.7 million different shades of color backgrounds. Some of these are suggestive. None of them functions in place of memory. Memory cannot be sequenced. Memory is usually non-designed. You are about to enter three rooms, mirror balls, roving wallpaper, disco, home furnishings, lifestyle, getting up, and having a drink. Of course, in some novelistic vein, sequencing is highly absorptive, and so at the subliminal i.e., non-designed level, the sequencing allows reading itself to become abstract, bracketed, hypnotic, and mesmerizing. The problem with most poetry, like most design and architecture, is that it is a little too bourgeois. For this reason, the poem should never be turned off. Like a thermostat, it should regulate the room's energies. This allows the piece to constantly erase itself. As we all know, poetry should aspire not to the condition of music but to the condition of relaxation and yoga. A lot of people think great poems should be memorized. As anyone who has ever read a poem will tell you poems are most beautiful and least egotistical at the exact moment in which they are forgotten like disco and other four-on-the-floor productions. Each sequence or sentence, i.e., word set, runs 7.2 seconds or the amount of time it takes to pronounce each word, one word at a time. Seven is generally thought to be the number of things the human brain can readily remember. George Muller did pioneering studies on this and his theory is called Muller's number seven. Hence, most phone numbers are seven digits in length. 7.2 seconds is hopefully just long enough to get the reader viewer into a groove. It might suggest a strobe light going off at timed intervals. The interval can be beautiful because the interval can be dubbed. Relaxation like non-designed home decor has no real bounds. It supplements that thing known as real life. That is why it is so pleasurable to read. Someone, I think, said the time for poems written with words and the era of reading poems with feelings in them is long gone. Today, no poem should be written to be read and the best form of poetry would make all our feelings disappear the moment we were having them. This sequencing of events constitutes a code more uncrackable and soothing than anything we could actually see. Paintings to be read, poems to be looked at, a beautiful poem should rewrite itself one half word at a time, in predetermined intervals. With their numerous circuit boards, televisions and computers do this. Together, they enhance the micro-production and sequencing of feelings here before thought inaccessible, complex, or purely entropic. If all poems could just be codes projected onto a wall, those names, accessories, for things cancelling the wall would be more beautiful than anything we could feel. Nothing that is negative is simple. Everything that is artificial is related to everything else in the room. Poetry should aspire to the most synthetic forms, the colors or numbers around it, and the most synthetic forms are to be found in houses with rectilinear walls, hallways, 
of foyers. Each wall separates one space from another. Everything that can be divided is divided into its proper sequence, i.e., style, of ones and twos. Private spaces are over-elaborated and under-inhabited. Public spaces are under-elaborated and lack sufficient feedback. Things that are living versus, things that are dead versus, languor. For this reason, poetry ought to be replaced by the walls that surround it and doors that lead into empty rooms, kitchens and hypnosis. Poetry should be camouflaged into the feelings that the room is having, like drapes, silverware, or candlesticks. All painting should aspire to the condition of encyclopedias, sequencing and BW diagrams. Niagara Falls is just a kind of paint. What would it be like to look at a poem? It would be the most beautiful thing in the room that could stand to be looked at. It would be more beautiful than the thing itself. A beautiful poem is a poem that can be repeated over and over again. You are reading about a poem comprised of a thousand wayward looks. Look, a beautiful poem is a painting that can be repeated over and over again. Repetition is the only thing that makes something more perfect than it already is. For this reason, there is always a gaze that does not reach inside the face I was looking at. That should be the gaze of poems that think they are paintings. Andy Warhol understood this and he repeated the look of a painting every time he painted the same thing over and over and over and over. That is why he painted over the faces of photographs. Nothing is more beautiful than a face when it is repeated like, a word for, makeup. Novels were the earliest form of photography known to the human retina. That is why books are rarely mistaken for paintings. Paintings, unlike words, die the minute they attach themselves to a wall. Someone else said, excitement is the only thing in the world that cannot be predicted. Figure 1. Figure 2. Niagara Falls is just a kind of paint. My name is Dorothy. Because we like to come to a given space of our choosing, everything we see tends to look like a diagram or flowchart, as if it were designed to produce comfort zones, trance passages, or look. Here is a house. Here are its binary coordinates. I was reading a story about the anti-actress Chloe Sevigny who is the most chaste after fashion trendsetter now because she's ugly beautiful, wears vintage prairie dresses one day and Eve St. Laurent the next, and seems negligent and muse-like at the same time. She often claims not to know what she's wearing. Someone said, she moves around the room like an anti-cheerleader, she goes shopping in Hello Kitty underwear, she played the Vapory Deb in the last days of disco and in Boys Don't Cry a trailer park girl who falls in love with a boy who's really a cross-dressing girl. She can make a beret look very recent, her publicist announced. She is trying to dissociate herself from fashion at the moment. When I think of Chloe Sevigny I feel the code book wobbling on my retina. Someone said, anticipation is an interesting and difficult thing to produce. The ultimate lifestyle exercise for a home is its television. It produces error after error. If knowledge and like pleasure takes place in the network, a poem should pursue itself in the set interval of time i.e., the time allotted to it. The ideal interval is programmed, usually 3 or 7 or 12, and expands indefinitely. In that way all the words, like portraiture or shades of color, could be replaced by something that reminded one of a couplet, an integer, a television set, a phone number or the revolving seasons. If one doesn't have a television set it is necessary to make one. It is now spring or it is now autumn when you read this. The temperature is the same across all three screens. Somewhere it is summer and I am losing someone because she is already gone. The television set is sitting on the windowsill. It resembles a canvas. These are the feelings television has and these are the ways we make our feelings disappear into them. Like small pieces of ice. The best paintings like poems make our feelings evaporate at a constant rate like a disco, which is nothing but a rotating system of words masquerading as numbers. I think it is snowing.
and I worry that the guests will be late. I flick on the screens. This is an election year, of course. How do incite the idea of reading without reading? How do accessorize reading as a practice similar to entertaining? One comes and then one goes. One adds something and then one subtracts something else. The most precious commodity in modern life is time. I live in a house like a series of loops, plus signs. Okay, that's it. It stopped. Um, but I, I was thinking about a bunch of things. I mean, we could talk if you wanted, if uh, we could sort of have a conversation sort of in between things, um, if anyone had any questions. But I was thinking in this particular piece, again, about the sort of temporal dimension of um, re the reading practices in literature in general. And literature tends to both repress um, its temporal dimension and its medial dimension. Um, so you don't really think, for example, when you're reading um, you know, a poem by um, sorry, Andrew Marvell to his coy mistress, which is all about time, but you don't really think about reading that um, line one at, say, 217, and line three at 219. So this piece is really about sort of the temporal dimension of reading. And I made it obvious in a way because there was a countdown clock on every sentence, so you're aware um, that a sentence takes so many seconds to read. Um, and <clears throat> you have parsing. Um, the text is addressable in a number of different levels. So you have um, a single word appearing, but you also have a sentence appearing, and you have a pictorial representation of the voice, although it's just a canned little um, app. It was designed um, by Microsoft to go with um, um, the Mac and Word so that you could play a voice back and it would, it would sound the voice out for you and it'd give you that little graphic. And the voice that we used was Dorothy, high quality. So, so there's, an audio, there's an audio component to this too, and it's, well, she's reading to you. But I was really also very interested in, well, how many different kinds of reading can you invoke in a single space? Uh, if you're reading by sentence, if you're reading word for word, if you've got an audio component that's different, someone's reading with you, but you're also shadowing that reading. So, well, what exactly is a reading? I think it's actually very complicated. And reading in this case is sort of, uh, um, it involves different media, um, because you're seeing something, obviously, but it also involves sort of voice. Um, you know, if I could have gotten smell in there, I would have, you know, like an old scratch and sniff book, and I've tried to do perfume with other reading experiences. But this was, an, again, an attempt to expand reading um, into a more diffusive atmospheric space um, that was sort of multimedia, amodal or multimodal, and also environmental. So. Um, and I found that the clock ticking sort of kept people engaged more than without the clock. I, without the timer, I don't know how many people would stick it out for 11 minutes. And maybe this is even too long as it sits. Maybe it should be paired by two minutes and it should be about nine minutes or something like that. But certainly this was about, uh, again, the temporal dimension um, and how it's normally not there. Does anyone have any questions or thoughts or anything? No, I didn't. I'm not, I actually don't know why I chose. The question was, why did I choose blue? Um, I don't really remember um, now if they, I gave that much thought. I think that may have been just a careless thing. <clears throat> okay. Um, I have a feeling like it creates a kind of. Um, industrial age anxiety with the clock ticking. So um, uh, what can you say about removing um, like a living voice and putting it into a mechanical voice and how does that change or limit maybe the reading? Because you know the intonation, there is no um, response from the machine to the audience as opposed to like when a poet is reading um, there is a different kind of anxiety uh, between because the poet is also reacting to the room. Were you anxious? Yes. <laughs> With the clock. With the clock, but not the voice. And, and the voice because it's also measured in a clock way. Uh-huh. 
Well, you know what? I, we thought about this. I actually thought that was kind of um, like a nursery rhyme or vaguely soothing to me. I, I've been, you know, I have an eight-year-old daughter now, and I read a lot to her at night. So reading as a practice is sort of interesting to me, and the nature of listening and the levels of participation. So yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I think yeah, this is initially when you hear Dorothy High Quality. You know, we went through, I, I listened to a lot of voices, but she seemed kind of the sexiest and the nicest. And I thought hearing her was sort of soothing, and I could, there was a kind of affective dimension that I felt like I could participate in. But maybe this is not true. In some ways, if you take away the human element, I, if I'm here reading, it's clearly a human voice, although it's mediated by all sorts of machines. Um, Maybe with that mechanical voice that forces you to participate more or interact more. I, it's, maybe it's more highly or um, humanly interactive. I don't really know. I, I'd be curious what other people think about that. Hi. Yeah, personally, I, I found it quite, like it produced quite a lot of sort of anxious, uncomfortable response, probably the... I find the voice actually sort of slightly stress-inducing. Um, so I'm just, I don't know if we could do like an informal poll of people, but <laughs> that was my reaction. And you have this kind of like heartbeat feeling type thing and the, the, the numbers counting down really quickly. So, and also blue I think is, um, I remember once I was a waiter and this wine manager told me if there's blue uh, label on the wine bottle, nobody will drink the wine. Like they're less likely to order it and it just, has that affective sort of quality for me, that particular color. So, yeah, so I didn't find that particularly relaxing. It was very interesting, but I know, um, yeah, so I, I don't know if that was the effect you were looking for, but. I mean, one other thing I would say here is that, um, you know, voice reproduction technologies um, in terms of artificial voice creation, of course, are much more sophisticated today than they were when I did that piece. And again, that was a spin-off by Microsoft so that it, um, so that it um, sort of worked with the uh, Microsoft Word and a Mac. Um, so, you know, I think things are a little better today with, uh, with those artificial voices. But I, so I think in some sense the piece is, uh, has a sort of kind of date to it that maybe registers differently than, uh, than when it was first done. I was slightly maybe more utopian and optimistic at the moment when that appeared. Um, yeah, any other questions? <clears throat> I, I I hate to heap on the uh, the computer voice piece there, but I uh, I am a person who's uh, I'm about sixty percent deaf. One one significant piece of reading for me is lip reading, um, and that uh, it, it was interesting to me to at a, at a poetry reading, you're more often seeing the you you get to watch the lips in this. For this, I was totally removed from you. I found myself occasionally drawn to watching what you were doing during this anyway, to to uh, kind of bring myself back to the human component, but the voice up there for me was was almost. A, a reminder to take back to that that um, that that less human space, mm -hmm. and I I for me there was there was a great deal of enjoyment actually in the fact that I was um, uh, torn between the the human author who was present but the words there which were deliberately removed from you in some ways, and it made me it made me think about the uh, the content without referring to the individual that might be attached to it in a very different way. Oh, that's and interesting. I, yeah. I mean, maybe I should have stepped away from the podium too. I usually walk away. Um, and just let these things play. I think maybe that's sort of a more interesting thing to do. I'm not sure, but I think perhaps that's another, I mean, and I don't like giving readings. You can probably figure this out by now. Um, you're gonna see, uh, this is a poetry reading, but you're gonna see 40 minutes of video, basically. So, all right, um, maybe we'll queue up the next one. I'll just introduce the next um, two videos. These were done, um, these, the videos you're about to see, there are two of them, um, were done in PowerPoint. I wanted to actually see um, if I could use PowerPoint as a delivery device or platform for literature. Literature and, and PowerPoint are not usually sort of um, seen as conducive. Um, and PowerPoint is also, you know, people think about PowerPoint and PowerPoint hell as being um, an extremely boring experience. Um, and in some ways I want this, wanted this reading to be quite very, very slow, meditational, and boring. And um, this is mostly, the first piece, Bibliographic Soundtrack, is 
The source material here is um, Tumblr sites. There's quite a bit of Twitter stuff. There's a lot of RSS feeds coming in. Um, I don't think I wrote much here. Oh, there's a poem in there that I wrote that I tweeted um, over a period of, I think, 20, 22 hours, something like that. So there's a Twitter poem in there. But um, I get turned over my phone to someone else at some point, and he was tweeting for me. So. Um, the poem was sort of multiply authored. But there are lots of invocations of other things. Um, PowerPoint is a very interesting platform because it has a kind of slide element, i.e. a photographic element. Um, it has a filmic element. You have all the dissolves and the fades that are just built into the system now. Um, but I think PowerPoint also references um, the book page um, and also the slide. Um, so you, it's, a, it's a very interesting multimedia platform and I was just interested in seeing, well, what would a literature in PowerPoint or on PowerPoint actually look like and how would it be read and how do you go about reading this? I tried to invoke a lot of literary things in these two videos, so there's um, a lot of attention to the couplet form as a structuring device on a particular slide. Um, but there's a lot of PowerPoint bullet, point, bullet, you know, there's all these bullet points that are dropping down too. But in some ways those, um, those are reminiscent of a couplet. And again, this is a very sort of time device. Um, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of communication mediums, SMS, um, IM chats. These are all very time sensitive. Well, I mean, I'm fairly aware that I got a particular message or a voicemail at a particular moment. One doesn't normally think about this uh, in literary in literature. I mean, the idea is right. You uh, you get into a a book or a reading and you forget what time it is. You get lost in it. Um, but I don't think this is true in general of communications as opposed to literary mediums. And so this piece in some ways is an attempt to straddle or find the point when a communication mediums, uh, medium can morph into a literary medium. Um, now I was reading a book by Ian Bogost who wrote a very interesting book and it's called what to do with video games or something like that. And he writes about two kinds of video games. One is a lean back video game, which introduces uh, meditation and drift. And the other is a lean forward game, which induces high anxiety and twitchiness. So the first video you're gonna see is lean back. It's really boring. Um, it um, sort of takes advantage of certain elements of distraction and um, so you should turn on your cell phones, I think, for the first one. And the second one is um, more anxiety producing, maybe like that first video. So we're gonna, I'm just gonna show portions of this. Um, the first uh, video is 44 minutes long. I mean, it's really endless. It's, I would like to do it for 24 hours, but I'm gonna show this one for maybe 10, 11 minutes, and then we're gonna show um, the PhD sounds. The PhD sounds has a um, soundtrack. So if you wanna get up, walk around, uh, dance, Feel free to. Okay, here we go.
So those were both done in uh, PowerPoint. Um, and we only showed, the first one we only showed about 10 minutes. So it gets, um, I think it gets kind of more boring as it goes on, um, which I think is a good thing. Um, that the, um, I was in a PhD program at Columbia for, oh gosh, how long was it? About 13 years, actually, it took me. <laughs> And I always tell people that after a few years, bibliographies start to look kind of sexy. So <clears throat> the second, both of those pieces were done for artist space earlier in the spring. And Richard Burkett had asked me to do an essay on a young duo called Duox. They were, they had a show at the Bard Curatorial Institute and I'd seen that show and I liked it. Um, but there was almost no material on them. So Richard said, oh, do you want to write um, an essay? It doesn't have to be about them. Just write something about, you know, that's related. So um, <clears throat> basically that's all the research materials for a paper that I didn't write on Duox. Um, but when you're researching or reading, or the, the, the reading that's associated with researching, I think is different than the reading that you do when you're in a restaurant reading a menu. And it's different from the reading that you do when you're um, reading an experimental Japanese novel. So I think um, this is reading conducted under the sign of Google, clicking, searching, skimming, scanning rapidly. It's just a different kind of reading process. And it's a kind of reading that I can do um, with music too. So this, you know, the music makes it kind of, um, again, sort of sexier. I do think reading can be sexy. People don't usually think about reading as sort of sexy, but I think it sort of can be sexy. So that was one thing I was trying to do with that that second piece. And the first piece I was just really trying to open up a kind of more diffuse environmental, um, sort of allocentric space um, where you're aware of the environment um, when you're, and I think also, you're, you know, you've, you've come to a cinema basically, so I've turned off the lights, I've forced you to sit in a chair and I've forced you to read. Um, and most people, when you go to the movies, you don't expect to read, right? So there's some sort of displacement and there's a relationship between sort of cinema where you're stuck in your chair and um, being in a sort of gallery where you're free to move around and just leave text. But this actually forces you to sort of sit still. And as I said, it's meant to be boring, um, but you could do things with your phone. And when we showed the, um, the first piece at Artist Space, we had a live Twitter feed running on this on a side screen, which was useful. It would have been use interesting to try that tonight. So we'd set up a hashtag and people were just Twittering as they were watching that and it created an interesting dialogue. And again, it, it opens up the space. You know, reading people think about reading as solitary um, and that instantly sort of made it social. It put it out in a room. Um, a room is sort of a performance undertaken by a group of people sitting together. And I think that's sort of what, what I was after in that first piece. Um, although again, we showed just a very sort of small section. I was, um, we did a lot of, and it didn't show up in that section, but I did a lot of stuff with um, video game walkthroughs. They sort of structure a lot of the sort of second half. Um, so, but are there any questions? I can take some questions and I'll show one or two more videos. Hi. Um, I, when I was watching this, actually, I found the first one very soothing and meditative, and I liked it a lot. <laughs> I liked how there was some poetry trickled in there. It felt like poetry. Um, I'm not sure what poetry is. That's what's so exactly. interesting about well, the medium. Like, what is poetry, and were, how do you read it? There was it? actually a sentence to me that became a poem. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was wondering, it made me think of Kenneth Goldsmith and sort of the uncreative writing of bringing ephemera and the things that you don't read really into a, a position of, of, of placement here of, 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 you know, so you want to read it or you sort of feel like you have to read it because it's on the screen, but you don't really want to read it because it's boring. Um, I just wanted to know if you read him or if, if you had any um, response to that sort of bringing ephemera to the forefront of of an artistic experience. Yeah, I've, no, I've known Kenny for a long time, actually. And it was a funny, I was having lunch with Kenny a few days ago and I was telling him this story. Um, but he sold my sister a dishwasher um, <laughs> in like 1982. This is before I, I knew Kenny. And I remember talking to my sister and my sister said, oh yeah, Kenny he sold us this dishwasher and it's filled with cockroaches. <laughs> So I told Kenny the story, and he he said, "Yeah, it was a it was a bad dishwasher." So, um, <clears throat> but anyway, um, 
Yeah, I think, um, well, you know what people think about an author, right, is controlling the material and authoring material. And now maybe being an author isn't controlling, it isn't about um, sort of producing material, it's arranging it or um, organizing it. And in some ways, that first piece is about um, a huge amount of information that a single person um, who maybe we used to call an author has organized it and sequenced it and arranged it. And maybe that constitutes a kind of version of subjectivity or at least cognition or some sort of self-engaged with, as you said, sort of ephemeral material. At what point uh, after sort of organizing that material does it become yours? Um, at what point um, can you say that, oh, I have a kind of subjective writerly or even readerly relation? Here are the lines, I think, between reading material and processing it and writing or generating material are kind of blurred as well. So, yeah, I think your point is very well taken. Um, for me, that material all resonated in some sort of way. It was sort of, that's a deeply personal thing. Is it autobiographical? Yeah, kind of. Is it novelistic? Yeah, sort of. I'm not sure, though. Um, but it's definitely specific to um, a lot of different uh, media platforms, um, in particular Tumblr, I think, and, um, and Twitter, um, for me. Those are, those are sort of dominant. But I used a lot of video game walkthroughs, and there was a lot of attention to just what I would call residual formats that I'm also deeply attached to, namely the couplet. Um, you know, the line break, um, sort of prominent here. And in some ways, poetry is about counting time, right? It's t poetry really slows reading down. You don't know where it's going to end exactly. It forces you to count syllables, creates all sorts of rhymes that also slow you down and make you very much aware of the sort of acoustic or auditory um, properties of language as they're deployed over time. A poem is perfect for that. And in this way, these pieces too are all about temporal deployment of language over a period of time. Um, they just don't seem to have a beginning or a middle or an end. Um, but I do think they, yeah, they touch on ownership of material and thus have to do with ideas of authorship, subjectivity and relationship to material in the very, very different ways it can be read. Like in that second piece, I think there's, uh, there's some like excruciatingly slow sections. And this is just have, it just has to do with sort of an arbitrary choice on my part to control an animation. But when the text, uh, the text is very small, it just moves very slowly. If you do a letter by letter dissolve and the text is like at a seven point font, it's going to clear that screen in like a minute and a half. It's, you know, I think I can't, the plank girl screen, it takes forever, right? It's four minutes. It hurts. It's, uh, it's so slow. But <clears throat> I think that's kind of interesting because you can get so many different and varied kinds of reading. Um, I mean, I think you have that with a book too. A book is a very haptic experience. And someone has said that um, reading um, in a book you know, as you move from script culture to a book culture, uh, breeds what's known as discontinuous reading. But suddenly you can skip pages, you can control your reading through a book, you're not unrolling a scroll and have to move in a linear way. So there are all sorts of things having to do with time, how you process words. Um, and I was reading this book by Stanislaw uh, Dehaene, and um, he argues that actually normal reading practices are very slow. They're hindered by the eye, because the eye can only move at a certain rate. And, it, you know, the eye is pretty good at moving, um, taking these what are called saccadic leaps, so it can jump six, eight words. Um, and you're not really reading word for word, you're actually sort of skimming when you read. But Dehaene has calculated um, that if you were to flash a word um, just at the center of a screen, um, so that the eye didn't have to move at all, um, a human being could read 1,100 words per minute. So, in some ways, the, um, that, the piece with the talking, that 11-minute painting, in some ways was an attempt to parse, again, the temporal dimension of the retinal processing of language um, by a human being. Although, as people have noted, it seemed kind of machine-like. All, right. All right. Okay. Any other questions? I just have, uh, <coughs> I have a question here. Can, can you hear me? Hi. Uh, yeah, I can't see you, though. I'm here. <laughs> oh, okay. I see you now. Yeah. Well, I just, very inspiring. Uh, the, the Chinese artists look at uh, you, when you do anything artistic work, you cannot be just, just descriptive. You have to reach the poetic kind of feeling, so to speak. And Chinese calligraphy, for example, emphasize the dynamic balance. Now, I wonder whether your work can also use Chinese calligraphy in it. 
and translate it to Chinese and then put it in a dynamic form that can add even more dimension to your uh, presentation as well, perhaps. Yes, I think, yeah, for me, I, don't, I can't write Chinese, but I think handwriting would be an interesting way to sort of, uh, again, account for the temporal delivery of language. Um, and how that constitutes a reading and how then it can be configured within particular sort of what I would call genre constructions. I, we read particular kinds of things in particular ways. And I'm doing this long piece now. It's 227 hours, but I'm taking five books and I'm having them machine read in different ways just to see. Um, and the first one is actually a very short book. It's Richard Browdigan's Trout Fishing in America. But I wanted to see how many different ways I could get a machine to read that and what would be the sort of affective dimension of those different kinds of reading processes. But your point about the uh, handwriting is very interesting because, again, um, you know, producing a handwritten text, and I'm very interested in marginalia now um, in terms of how it affects reading. And you can, I mean, I, my books are, you know, this is because I'm an academic, really, but my books are just littered with all sorts of different kinds of marginalia. And I think it used to be that when you read a book, you left a lot of your traces in the book as you read. But now that we're reading online, um, we kind of are the trace that's left behind. So you have a lot of these reading platforms, like one of the, my favorite ones is called Read It For Later. These are all the things that I want to read that I don't have time to read right now. So I instantly tag it um, and I can categorize it. And I have this huge archive of Read It For Later. It must be 700 items now. I don't know if I'm ever going to read it, but it is my attempt to manage um, a huge amount of reading material that I want to get to. So again, it's highly personal. Um, mm. Is this is that our version of is that our version of novel our novel today? Maybe I don't know. I just okay. want to, I just want to add one note that like the the uh, the Chinese calligrapher Wang Dongling wrote the Tao Te Jin that Lao Tzu's Tao Te Jin five thousand words. It took him three days three nights to take the whole st stage practically to finish that calligraphy. So your word can be translated, perhaps, then become something as well. Any other questions? OK. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, so uh, I was wondering about the interaction of the audience and the work, because, I mean, the reading is a play right between the reader and the text. So, but in an environment such as a theater, it's a really, the audience is a really passive kind of a sub, uh, subject, right? We sit in these um, isolated little chairs and uh, nobody moves around. It's a very infantile kind of a little safe position. And, um, so the audience becomes really passive and there's this loud music that penetrates the body and this hyper information that's being like thrown at the audience. So I'm wondering like what is the possibility maybe to make it more um, uh, or what can one do to uh, create more of a possibility for this uh, reading to take place between the audience and the text and not just kind of being, you know, not like as a passive audience, but maybe something of a more of an active. I mean, you're, are you comparing um, reading in an audience like this with a bunch of other people around you to reading a book on your own? What's the I'm comparison? I'm thinking about reading as a process. Mm -hmm. And, and as a process of interaction between the reader. So, because if it's poetry... Oh, I understand. I, th I think I have... Yeah, uh, yeah okay. I have some, okay. A reading takes place <clears throat> as opposed to a viewing or being uh, a watching of passively yes. versus an reading as an active uh, practice. Yeah, okay. I, I can answer that. I think I have an idea now. Um, yeah, so very usually when you read a book, it's, it's true. You really want to take control of your reading process. People really want to own that reading. 
Um, they control how fast they're going to move. With a codex or a book, you turn the page, right? The text isn't moving. You control the eye movement on the page. But in this situation, you have very little choice. It's very true. But I was actually interested in that. I wanted the reader to be, I wanted the reader to sort of give up, to surrender completely to another process. And, I, you know, I've been, um, um, I, I, this I think invokes, I went to this, um, gallery show at um, David's Werner. It was a guy named Doug Wheeler, and he created a room where he put a curve in the front and <clears throat> lit it from behind so that when you walked into the space, you were completely disoriented. You, you didn't know where you were. Um, you were looking up, essentially, um, and it's and because you got lost in the space. People compared it to sort of dying and going to heaven. Um, but this this kind of piece was sort of about um, a s surrendering to something else as opposed, like when you have a book in front of you in this what's called the parapersonal space, you own that space. You control it. And what you're saying is, oh, I have an active engagement with the text and I'm doing what I want to do. I'm turning the page when I want to. I'm putting notations in where I want to. I own the text. I wanted to get rid of that. I wanted you to, I wanted you to have not have that power over the text at all. I wanted you to be completely sort of you know, sucked into something else. And for me, that's kind of like, um, yeah, like the Doug Wheeler piece. It's you're, you can no longer, you no longer own a space around your body. You are suddenly in this large amorphous space. You feel completely lost. You have to tiptoe because you're afraid you're going to hit a wall, but you're really walking in something like a cloud. And, um, you know, the people who do sort of neural Zen meditation studies have called this uh, an allocentric space where your gaze is it basically above the horizon, you sort of, the body gets lost in this space and you basically have no control over anything. So I would say, to answer your question, I wanted you to be less active. I wanted to disable your ability to control your movement um, through the text. So, but yeah, that's really interesting what you're saying. Um, so then it's, uh, this kind of um, viewing evokes for me up being in like a downtown kind of this kind of management society where you're a, this kind of a subject that's always like in um, hypersaturated world where you're always so passive already. So that's why maybe this anxiety comes yes. when this, you know, when I see this kind of a, um, performance. But I would just say that I would not really call this a reading from the audience. Mm-hmm. I understand that too. I mean, my here I would say though I would say the reading of a book with uh, by an individual is different than reading in a cinematic setting. So it is different. I think you are reading differently, surrounded by a few other people. It's what Warhol said when he watched movies. He said, "Oh my gosh, when I watch a horror movie and there are other people around me, it's uh, it's really truly frightening because the person next to me is." scared or something. So I think when you're reading in a group, it is maybe subtly different than reading on your own. I think maybe I can get you to give up yourself a little more easily. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not assuming that um, one, when one reads a book, one controls the space or the text. I feel like the text also has an equal play in how it regulates the reading itself, mm -hmm. but just to throw it out there. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so we'll move on. I'll show a few more videos or two more videos, just uh, short excerpts. Um, the next piece I'm going to show is, um, I forget the name of it actually. Uh, <clears throat> I had it written down, but... Well, anyway, it's uh, something I did for the um, ontological hysterical uh, theater. And um, this was kind of um, based on the idea that, like, if given a choice, if text is running and an image or a movie is playing, no one will read the text. This is true, right? No one, no one will look at text if there's something to look at. So this was kind of um, a fuck you to poetry. So there are two screens here. There's poetry running on one side and there's a movie on the other side. And this is also another disco piece. So I just went to YouTube, I typed in disco, and the first seven movies I just sampled. And we cut them in and we were running the, di the disco movies. Now the text on the left-hand side is just the text I took from the first 
12 pages of blip soak. So we're running that and you'll see it moving off the cursor. Now it seems to be moving very, very fast, but it's actually moving at the speech at which someone could speak it. So for the presentation at the Ontological Hysterical Theater, we, um, I, uh, yes, I worked with three actors and they memorized the text and they read the text while the movie was playing and they controlled when the movie would run and not. So they were essentially sort of DJing the reading practice in relationship to a filmic event. Um, anyway, so that's, that's the background. We can talk a little bit about it in a few minutes. Okay, so here we go. Why couldn't you just save me? Because my world is not 
the font is very small on that so we're just gonna I'm just gonna show um, the last video and then we're gonna let that just run on it runs for a long time it's a sequenced um, piece with uh, one word another word and third words and the idea again was um, how many words do you need to sort of generate um, a sort of feeling of uh, meaning or create some sort of meaning and I used a lot of materials here there's a lot of sampled work in here um, I ran a number of Emily Dickinson poems and John Ashbury through this uh, machine reading system. So we're gonna read, I'm just gonna let this go and then we'll take final questions, okay? And um, yeah, this piece has um, a sort of color randomizer halfway through. So halfway through, there's a lot of color, but I don't think we're gonna get through that far tonight. All right, here we go. Oh, is there any music? There should be music for this one. <laughs> oh, maybe not. I can't remember now. I thought I put audio on this one. And this starts off very abstract, but it sort of starts to make more sense as it moves forward. And there's more of a narrative component. Um, the beginning is sort of more etymological wordplay. I use a lot of rhyming dictionaries. So the composition is, I mean, was interesting to me, but it's quite abstract in the beginning. And I think there was a soundtrack, I think, on the Penn Sound side. <laughs> Yeah, you can see the whole thing. It's a great screensaver, actually. One, um, <laughs> the uh, this this played at the uh, Yale Art Museum, and uh, uh, I found out afterwards that teachers, elementary school teachers, were bringing kids in to see this, because six and seven year olds, when they try to read this, they'll sound things out. There's a lot of phonetic work in here, but they'll also try to put one word next to another and another to sort of, and they were trying to read it. They were just learning to read, but in some ways this is about sort of, um, you know, word recognition and then interpretation, those two staged processes in the reading acquisition. And, and it's particularly interesting with a seven and eight year old, and they were just glued, they were fascinated by it. So I thought, oh, that's good. Maybe uh, I can, uh, you know, help school children read.
But again, what was interesting for me here was the sort of um, variety you could get in terms of um, putting things together to make sense. There's so many different ways to do it. And um, This is really background, so if anyone has questions, we can just talk. I know it's really late, it's, eight, it's 8.30 already, so um, if anyone has questions or... No, there's no Dickinson yet. That's coming up. And uh, I sampled a very long uh, sort of John Ashbery poem, those lacustrine cities. Um, and it's, and you know, Dickinson was so interesting here because you have your, you have your sort of cycle um, and you have a pause and you have sort of a line break mechanism at the end of the, at the three line, three word sort of deployment. Um, and pauses are so crucial in Dickinson, um, especially with regards to the sort of hyphen or dash or whatever it is. And so by playing and by inserting a Dickinson poem, you, it was altering the tempo at which you would read and it was giving a different inflection to the dashes. So the machine in some ways was rereading Emily Dickinson. And it, it was, I mean, I found the Dickinson very interesting. I put a lot of Reznikoff in. I put in quite a bit of Charles Olson. There's a lot of sampling of Jack Spicer in here. So it's a long work. Um, yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, Tan, hi. Um, uh, since we don't have any music to this piece, can you comment on the role of music in your work? Um, I started thinking about that um, during the piece that ended with New Order because the part I think that I liked the best about it was the words kind of being revealed in a fairly rhythmic way across the screen. And it seemed as if I didn't really need to be reading words. I thought letters or numbers or something that looked like writing would have been sufficient. So I guess it's really two questions, the role of music, and then do these need to actually be words? Mm, no, not really, but it's, I think you do read with the music. I think music colors, you know, people always say that music colors a reading, right? And um, here I used, you know, I just chose colors off the sort of um, the palette that was available in PowerPoint. Um, I wanted to make it as varied as possible because I think reading processes are extremely variegated. Um, and, you know, you just, by just altering the speed, by altering the way the, the words are moving, by altering the color, you sort of, you change the sort of affective dimensions of a reading and, an, uh, and a reader's re relationship to the text. In some ways, I wanted to reverse the whole position and say, well, and as you point out, you don't really need to read this. The, in some ways, the text is a background to a set of changing colors and musics. Normally, we think about sort of music, or I do anyway, music as a kind of background to the reading process. Here, the, there was an attempt to reverse it. And in the uh, PhD sound, um, the squares were sort of configured. I mean, for me, they were configured to uh, remind me of 12-inch vinyl. Um, so, you know, there were for, there are format issues here, too. And the new order graphic design is incredibly interesting. And so, of course, font delivery, graphic, you know, the sort of graphic design of record labels, all that's sort of implicated in how we read and it affects how we read. So that's why there are references to those things. But yeah, color is very, very important. That's why in the second half, this was initially done in director, so it's a live processing thing. This is just a movie now. But in director, halfway through, um, every word that appears is um, bracketed. It's, you know, there's a block, a colored block around it, and the block is different every time. So I really did want to create a piece of textual wallpaper that was endlessly changing. But the words themselves were composed. Some people asked me, oh, are these words random? And I think they could have been random, maybe. But I actually wanted to compose this and make a poem out of it, or whatever it is. I don't know if it's, uh, if this qualifies as poetry, but it's certain, it has certain elements um, or the atmospheric of the poetic that I was interested in more than the, pro the poetic per se. I mean, what is this sort of, I mean, people say, right, literature is atmospheric. 
Um, well, what does that mean? And I was, these were sort of attempts to get at that idea of the atmospheric qualities of literature in a fairly um, sort of literal way. I wanted to sort of spray perfume in this room too. If we, that's because, you know, the, while you're reading, that would sort of also affect the reading and the diffusion of textual matter into a physical space. Because the reading really is, reading always takes place in a particular environment. Although this, I think the environment is um, sort of, um, you know, people don't really think about when they read a book. But I remember reading Richard Browdigan in, you know, in high school, the, the place I read it was sort of crucial for my reading of Richard Brown again. Yeah, other questions? <laughs> I'm just lazy. She said, why don't I turn around when people laugh at the words? But. Other questions? Thank you. Um, I really like your work, especially the connection to uh, type word and image. And I was um, fascinated by the bibliographies. I myself also collect bibliographies and bibliographies of bibliographies and kind of have a fetish for them. Um, one thing I found fascinating was the hunt and gather effect of the researcher and how often that gets overlooked within the public domain and how the researcher often has to... F um, uh, as an artist or writer or perhaps PhD student or academic has to follow certain rules within the English language. And one thing I found fascinating within the uh, bibliographic pieces um, was that you were breaking the confines of perhaps the English language formalities that um, academia kind of forces us to follow within society. I find that fascinating to not necessarily follow the, the constraints of the English language on a social political level, as well as perhaps Kate Tarabian's MLA handbook. Mm -hmm. um, so in that regard, it's really fascinating work. Thank you. I mean, I think it echoes what, I, I don't know your name right above, who was talking about um, being captive or passive. And I do feel that um, maybe in some ways you're talking about a similar thing, which is the bibliographical format and um, the sort of um, my forcing you to do something. I think the, there, you know, there is a very strong um, element uh, to suggest that, oh, we live in a fully administered life these days. And in some ways, the bureau bureaucratic structures, the organizational formats, um, the controlled vocabulary systems that we inhabit actually do impede. Um, and this she referenced, she said, oh, I feel kind of um, forced to do things that you know, I don't want to do. So I think there is definitely that element and the, the work sort of um, means to incorporate that because I do think we live in a, in a life that is fully administered today. Um, but within that sphere, I think there's room for a little bit of freedom, but not too much. So, yeah. Other questions, thoughts? Okay, thank you. Oh, and uh, you know what? I wanted to thank uh, Ashley and uh, Doug up there for administering, and again, Eric Lorber for bringing me to Minneapolis. It's very nice to be here. <laughs> <laughs>